and uh, I know many of you are just tuning in. This is our fifth in a series of COVID recovery uh, podcasts or, or Zoom calls, as we uh, refer to them. We have more than 100 people signed up uh, for this, so I'm going to let a, a few more people in. But uh, while, while we're waiting, I've been kind of reading this book on happiness, you know, because in these days you need a, a lift. So I'm going to share with you a couple of uh, these, um, you know, while we wait uh, and, and we'll start right on time. So this one uh, is a quote. It says, I would maintain that thanks are the highest form of thoughts and that gratitude is happiness doubled by wonder. You know, as we, we think about what all of us are facing uh, collectively, and especially, you know, those on the front lines, the nurses, the doctors, uh, who are uh, just getting up every morning, opening their eyes, uh, getting ready for work, and walking into a situation that really none of us uh, could imagine, uh, and, you know, saving lives and, and giving uh, help to those uh, most in need. Uh, really in a selfless manner. It, it's just really nice to see the thanks and gratitude that are extended their way. And uh, I just wanted to share a quick story. Yesterday, we had a local bank, uh, Northeastern Savings Bank, call me and said, how can we uh, express our thanks and gratitude? And uh, we quickly got the presence of the hospitals on, on, on the line. And uh, they immediately, they delivered 450 boxed meals uh, to each of the health facilities uh, in the city of Brockton today. And of course, those facilities serve all of Metro South and the entire region. All of the health facilities really, uh, for the most part, are in the city of Brockton, but service the entire region. So uh, it's nice to see when uh, banks and, and uh, businesses step up and when people say thank you, because I, I think that quote uh, uh, is, is really relevant for today. So uh, I do wanna get started. I see our numbers are getting up there in participants and we have all most of our panelists here. Uh, I want to thank everybody for working with us. I know uh, usually we're at 2 o'clock. We, we bumped up to 1.30. Uh, I know the SBA has a mandatory meeting at 2, and I know the mayor has been running back and forth. Obviously, we were, we were at the uh, peak here, we hope, uh, of uh, infections, and as a result, um, people's schedules are uh, a little uh, jumbled. But we're going to try to share as much information as we can with you uh, in the business community, in the community, the greater Brockton area. Uh, to try to help you uh, access some of these resources. Uh, so as I said, this is the fifth uh, in a series. Um, we will review and update uh, what's happened with uh, city, state, and federal resources over the past week. Uh, we will record this uh, session and post it on our website, which is metrosouthchamber.com. There is a page there called the COVID Recovery page, and there's a lot of great information on there and access to different grants and resources anywhere from mortgage uh, payments to uh, small business loans to, uh, uh, you know, we're gonna hear this about this a little bit more, but uh, millions of dollars that are available to small businesses uh, and large businesses in this round. Uh, there's Q and A section down below. Uh, please write in your questions. We'll try to distribute those to the panelists. They'll all be able to see them. Uh, I'll ask those that aren't answered through the sessions, and then uh, we'll try to distribute them after if there are additional questions and ask uh, the panelists to answer them and get them back to you and post them so that everyone can see. Uh, I wanna thank our promotion partners. Uh, this week, we had a number, including the Brockton Area NAACP, uh, the Cape Verdean Association, uh, the Bridgewater Business Association, the, Met the um, Massachusetts Small Business Development Center, the Randolph Chamber of Commerce, the Stoughton Chamber of Commerce, uh, the Eastern Chamber of Commerce, the Montello Business Association, the Campbell Business Association. So I wanna thank all of them for distributing and promoting this as well. Uh, we're delighted to have with us today a special guest, um, Congressman Joe Kennedy. I'm gonna introduce him later uh, in a few minutes, but uh, I wanted to, before we hear from him, start off uh, with a quick update from Eli Speu from the Small Business Administration. He's gonna kind of give us uh, just uh, what's new since yesterday in terms of uh, the programs and how they're working. And then of course, we're gonna hear from the Congressman. Uh, we're very appreciative in the role he played in uh, bringing these resources forward and uh, balancing all that he is. I was on a call a, a couple of weeks ago and he was talking about his schedule uh, with his children and all that and then running back and forth to DC and I, we omens work. Thank you, Congressman. Uh, so Eli, uh, I know you're on the line. Can you share with us uh, what's new? 
All righty, Chris. Well, good afternoon to you and, and to everybody on the line. Um, I'm going to load up my PowerPoint over here real quick so everybody can see it. And uh, obviously our, our wonderful logo that everyone is now familiar with. But before I get started with some of the information, um, I, I, I just want to thank you for putting this information session together again uh, week after week. And uh, just want to thank the congressman, you know, and, and the entire, you know, Massachusetts delegation for the work that they're doing to make this fun and available for small businesses, you know, um, here in Massachusetts. And, and I cannot tell you how fortunate we are, you know, once again, um, to have so many, so many lending partners willing and able to just, um, you know, uh, to, to, to participate in this program and to, to do such a tremendous uh, work here in, in the state. So I have some numbers that I want to share with everybody. Um, this is truly a success story. And, uh, you know, with the second round of, of funding, this program is, is definitely going to go a, a lot smoother than the first round when we did not have the guidance, when we did not, not have as many lenders, you know, fully uh, ready and, and um, up to speed on the program. So, so now, you know, knowing what we have uh, in place, I think this, you know, second round of funding is going to get exhausted quicker. And the first one, just because, you know, lenders are more famil familiar with the program. Uh, they've got the tools in place. They got the systems up and running. So as soon as the agency makes the, the program available, I think, you know, hopefully, you know, uh, a lot more small businesses here in the state are going to benefit from, from this, uh, this program. So uh, just some national numbers real quick and some regional numbers that I, I did want to share with everyone. Obviously, this is not, you know, this is not news as of yesterday, as you mentioned. So this is from the first round of funding, um, which, which basically was exhausted on, on April 16th. But nationally, you can see, you know, close to 5,000 lenders, you know, participating in the program. 1.6 million small businesses took advantage nationally um, on, from, from this, this program. And, and here in Massachusetts, you can see close to 47,000 small businesses actually benefited from the Paycheck Protection Loan Program. Just a, a, an amazing number of you know, applications in a short 14-day window. So uh, uh, again, a, a big, you know, big thank you to our lending partners. I, I'm, I'm sure there's some on the line. And uh, you know, we, we truly could not have done it without their help. So very appreciative of everything that they're doing. Um, these are some big numbers. I mean, the the uh, district office here has not done this type of volume in the last 10 years combined. So 47, almost 47,000 loans is more than what we, we've done in the last 10 years. So, so this is more on the national level. Um, so just want folks to know that um, this funding has been made available, you know, to small businesses. The majority, about 74% of all loans, um, you can see here, you know, the numbers speak for themselves, are for less than $150,000. So 75% of the units uh, went to the very small, small businesses. And again, um, could, could not be any more appreciative of, of you know, uh, Congressman uh, Kennedy and, and the Massachusetts delegation for, you know, uh, making a $60 billion, you know, reserve on the second round of funding for uh, businesses that are underbanked and underserved. So we will have that set aside in addition to um, the overall funding of, of the second round of the PPP program. So quickly about the program itself, um, and uh, Chris, tell me if everyone can see the slides, you know, uh, just, just fine. Uh, I can. Okay. All right. Good. So let us know out there if you cannot see the slides, they are up. And right now the one that's up is paycheck program basics. Thank you. Okay. Wonderful. So uh, again, I, I just want to share with, with the audience that the intent of this program is to keep businesses, you know, um, not necessarily open, right, but to keep them on the ready. 
you know, we want small businesses to keep their employees on the payroll, you know, not on the, you know, unemployment rolls, and especially not uninsured in the middle of a pandemic. So that is what small businesses need to understand. The, the reason why this loan is going to get forgiven, right, under the rules of the program is because that's what, you know, the government is asking of small businesses. We're asking them to stay closed, to, be, to stay safe, right? To um, make all available arrangements for their people to be safe. And this is part of the reason why this program, you know, will have the loan forgiveness component to it. But, you know, um, obviously it, it does carry a 100% guarantee from, from the government. The maximum loan size is up to $10 million. Again, it's gonna be fixed at a 1% rate two-year maturity, just like the first round, and no payments, right? So the, the payment deferment is for six months on this program. Um, so again, folks need to know that the program will be available until June 30th of 2020. But chances are, just like the first round of funding expired in 14 days, this one's not gonna you know, last a whole lot, lot, a whole lot longer. And the um, only reason I say that is because it's not quite as large of a pool and obviously we've got a lot more participating lenders currently. So just to share with you guys, in Massachusetts alone, we had 458 participating lenders, which is just amazing when you think about it because it's almost three times the size of, of the, or the number of lenders we normally have throughout the year doing 504 and 70 loans. So definitely, you know, there's, there's a big interest on in the lending community and, and they've, they've done a phenomenal job, truly. I, I also want to remind folks that, you know, um, lending institutions don't have unlimited resources. So I know a lot of people were left out of the first round, not, not intentionally, but, you know, lenders could only do so much. And, and you could see that the majority of the loans was actually approved by smaller banks, credit unions, community banks, who, you know, for the most part have to, you know, manually enter this data in the system. So quickly, just a reminder um, that the loans, the, the payroll costs are, are truly the driver of the forgiven loan amount. Okay, so on the next slide, I'm gonna be talking about some of the covered expenses, but folks need to, to keep in mind that the loans need to be closed within 10 calendar days. So, um, and as soon as, you know, they get the funding, business owners need to bring back, you know, their employees um, that they either furloughed or laid off or in cases where people are not coming, coming back, they need to rehire. So. Uh, in order to take advantage of, of the full benefit that is for the forgiven loan amount. So again, eight weeks of um, the average monthly payroll will be forgiven. Okay, so we're, we're talking about uh, 2019 figures and, and there's, uh, there's a lot of information out there. I, I, I would like to tell folks that, you know, um, there is an if information overload issue out there. People are confusing information from the actual um, bill, the Senate bill versus the Congress bill, version of the bill. Um, we've got a few interim final rules out there. We've got specific rules for, you know, uh, sole proprietors versus uh, regular businesses. Um, and by regular, I mean folks with employees, W-2 employees and whatnot, with legal formations. So work with your, your um, uh, bankers, Think of your lenders as part of the team. Um, their rela relationships do matter. So uh, I cannot stress that enough. I, I may have said this uh, in the last few sessions, but very important that you trust your banker, okay? And, and you work with them. At the end of the day, uh, they're not underwriting these loans. Um, you're certifying, you as the small business owner, you're certifying to the truthfulness of the information, um, you, you've got more than enough certifications on the application for them to, to make this loan available to you and your business. So, but with that said, the burden of proof is also on the small business 
to provide to the lender the documentation they need um, when the time comes for you know for uh, the forgiveness of the loan. So on the right of, of the slide over here, you know we've got the payroll costs, we've got mortgage interest, okay, we've got utilities. But you have to keep in mind that those services had to have been in existence as of February 15th, okay? So that's the um, very important date. So business had to have been in operation on February 15th and those services had to have been in, in place by February 15th. So this is another program that I just want to touch base on quickly. And, and I know um, I'm, I'm getting close to my time allowed here on, on, on the program today, but I definitely want to mention this debt refinance program uh, because this is another program that was enacted with the CARES Act. And, and again, um, very appreciative of, of what, you know, Congressman Kennedy is doing and, and, and the entire Massachusetts delegation for that matter. But this is a program that um, our small businesses here in the state are really going to take, you know, a uh, the, the, the major benefit. So Massachusetts is one of the top five district offices in the country, for that matter. And over the past at least 10 years that I remember, we've been one of the top five offices for SBA loan um, activity. So. A lot of small businesses are going to take advantage of this program because of the sheer number of 7A and 504 loans we have in the books. So what the SBA is going to be doing in accordance with the CARES Act, uh, we will be paying six months worth of principal and interest, okay, along with some fees to, to, that the borrowers owe to banks, you know, on monthly payments. Uh, to CDCs for the five before loan debentures and microloans for that matter. So um, people need to know that they don't need to do anything. So small businesses are going to get the benefit um, one way or another, even if their loans are deferred. Okay, they they will get this six month of uh, you know payment, defer, uh, not deferral, but for forgiveness truly. So the agency is making the payment on behalf of the borrower. So they don't need to worry about pay, paying their 7A and 504 loan for the next six months, okay? The loan does have to be in regular servicing, however. So it cannot be a loan in liquidation, but if it's late, you know, a, a couple of months and it's still in regular servicing, it still would qualify for the six month uh, benefit. So. With that said, that's the end of my presentation. I do have time for a few questions, but I know the program is gonna continue. So uh, unfortunately I cannot stay for um, past two o'clock. I understand Eli, thank you so much for all the work that your team is doing. I know there's only a staff of 11 uh, in Massachusetts working for the SBA. Uh, and I seem to be on a call with uh, one or the other uh, almost daily. So thanks for everything that you've done. I know that your team, including Susan Laurie, who's also on the call, will be helping to answer the questions, uh, if not right now, afterwards, and we can send those uh, answers out. Um, but I do wanna thank you. Uh, just as an example, on the 7A loan and the 504 forgiveness, we had a local company that received a credit of $66,000 that represented six payments that he would have had to make on a loan that he has secured. So, don't overlook the other pieces of this uh, other than EIDL and PPP. It's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Congressman Kennedy. You know, uh, he represents many of us in this region and uh, I can tell you I'm pleased to, be able to introduce him here today. Uh, he has done yeoman's work in uh, Congress, uh, representing uh, um, many of us in this region. Uh, I, I happen to overlap with him when I was down the Cape as well. And, um, I know he's very active with the House Energy and Commerce Committee. Uh, he's active with STEM education uh, at the local uh, and community college level. Um, he is uh, an advocate for the Manufacturing the American Manufacturing Act, which has re re uh, re produced a lot of resources for our manufacturers, uh, which are, are many in this. So, Congressman, uh, thank you. I don't know how you do it all. You were here with us just, uh, I think, six or eight weeks ago before all this hit. And uh, again, we were talking 
about your 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 life of moving around back and forth and all that. And I think the last 24 hours probably was some more of that. Uh, welcome and how are you doing? <laughs> Uh, hey, it's great to be with you. Thank you so much for having me back. Um, it is a um, big change over the course of since the last time I saw you guys till now. Um, you know, uh, uh, certainly a, a different world and a different environment. Um, the last 24 hours, um, yes, about 17 of those 24 were spent in a car down to DC and back. So uh, it was nice to get home at about 1.30 in the morning last night. Um, and for those of you with uh, young kids, you will know that they seem to have a sixth sense as to when work keeps you out late because they decide to wake up ever earlier and jump on your head. So that was a nice surprise um, earlier this morning. So it goes. Um, but listen, I, I wanted to say a couple things. Um, first off, grateful to have the opportunity to, uh, to speak with everybody today. Second, uh, how important um, organizations like Chambers um, are in order to bring people together and disseminate uh, information. And obviously, not could not be a more critical time or a moment. Um, to do so uh, than now, and to really um, recognize and uh, appreciate the work of the SBA. And I know, um, I know they have been, the fact that they've done more, uh, put more loans in the past month than they had in 10 years. I mean, you're looking at a number of 47,000, you have a staff of 11, um, just jaw dropping. Um, and I know that also comments on, I, I'm certain I've seen some comments that come from questions. Uh, that there's still a considerable amount of frustration out there given that there's so much still unmet need. So many people that are looking for support, so much need that is the, uh, that is there. Um, and that comes back um, more than a bit on Congress as well. Right? Um, and so happy to get into some of the details of the package that just uh, was approved um, uh, yesterday afternoon. Um, the president, uh, I believe, should have already signed it when he went to his desk late last night or today. Um, and substantial additional sums of money that should be coming to try to assist small businesses. Um, so to the tune of um, about, uh, if I remember out of all the numbers correctly, but to the tune of about 370 billion, 380 billion dollars. Um, so it's an awful lot of money. The vast majority of that goes to the PPP program. There's some EIDL money, there's a couple other buckets there that, um, uh, that have additional support, um, which is great. I also agree um, that the turnaround from this uh, from this round of funding uh, to getting out into the, the um, uh, needs of small businesses should be faster. That um, bureaucratic requirements, the rules, the regulations, the systems that had to get set up last time don't have to get set up again this time. It's just the money has to come so we can flow that through. So that should be uh, a benefit. The challenge and the frustration that I have uh, with this is that we also know that it's not going to be nearly enough. Um, the estimates that I've heard from um, business owners, from bankers, from economists, is somewhere in the order of a trillion dollars that's actually going to be needed in order to support small businesses um, and perhaps north of that, um, in order to give them the, the um, flexibility, the funds that are, are necessary in order to get through this extremely challenging and unprecedented time. We've passed, again, rough cut here, about $600 billion. So call it, again, rough numbers here, about 60% of the way there. Um, the the funding that we've put through, there's estimates and um, that this will last from a handful of days to maybe it gets you through a week before that funding gets exhausted again. Um, and my frustration just is if you're going to pull us all the way back in from uh, into Washington to to pass a, the next round of funding, let's do something that's not going to make sure that small business owners that are already in an extremely fragile um, environment are going to be even more frustrated and even angrier when come Wednesday, perhaps of next week, those loans again are, and those funds again have dried up and they can't get access to them. Um, because to do this again, it might take, well, in, a, in the time lapse of Congress, it will be quick, perhaps for another round to be a couple of weeks. That's a lifetime for small businesses, particularly if you didn't get money in the first round or the second round. It's, you've now gone two months without any additional funds. And so we're, I've been pushing, um, was pushing pretty strong over the course of the past couple of days to try to say, hey, if we're going to do this, which we need to do, um, that, that small business funding was needed and necessary. Um, but you heard from uh, our SBA team already saying that um, given the amount of need that they've been able to process, and again, extraordinary work, but um, there's, there's a lot of businesses that are lined up for additional assistance. And so let's actually do this so that you don't uh, complicate their lives um, and the folks that are actually trying to make the system work and get that assistance out. 
to that end, um, I also have a couple of, uh, in my, my district staff that are, is here in Massachusetts, we've got two people that are dedicated to trying to provide assistance to businesses and individuals that are trying to uh, avail themselves of these resources, whether that's issues with the direct cash payments, um, which you can get into if you want, um, but that was the $1,200 if you're making less than $75,000 a year. Uh, there, people have questions or, or issues with that, uh, issues with the administration of that program, they can certainly reach out to our office um, and also, obviously, with the PPP program, um, if there's issues there, you can certainly reach out to our office. Kevin O'Neill in our office um, has been headlining those efforts. He's on, excuse me, he's, he's on this call. Um, I don't think, I think the mic is muted, um, but he is here. And, and so you can make sure you've got um, uh, access to this information. Lastly, um, our website, kennedy.house.gov, has right up at the top um, a COVID resource uh, uh, link, which you can click on it, and it will give you a whole bunch of um, uh, additional information about everything from mental behavior health supports to um, small business information to helpful links and, and access to information that um, I think can be beneficial. There's also our contact information. So contact information for our office in Washington, office in D.C., or excuse me, office in Washington, office in Newton, and office in Attleboro. Um, and so if folks have questions. Um, you can reach out through the website, through those phone numbers. Our team is, like everybody else at this point, working from home, but they are getting those messages and returning those calls. So um, let us know how we can help. It is opportunities like this and getting that feedback from community members that is critically important. Um, and we want to make sure we're fighting for and able to provide all of the, the assistance that we can given an extremely challenging time. So thanks so much and have to take a couple questions, Chris, if we've got some time. Yeah, so I, I, we do have a couple of questions. Thank you, Congressman. Um, you know, there's a lot of questions around resources and follow up. Some companies had applied in the first round and haven't heard back. Uh, it sounds yeah. like someone is available to help with that. Uh, in addition, I know in talking with uh, Bob Nelson from the SBA, who works closely with your office, that the 1 800 number actually is pretty easy to get through right now because the second round hasn't fully gone active. So there's been a little bit of a lull, and I know several people have called or emailed and, and received pretty quick responses on that. That, uh, I'll ask Emma and Lexi. Probably not gonna last all that long. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, get your right. a question here. Um, uh, let's see. Da, 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 da. As a small shop, open shop, shop construction company, the sudden drop in residential real estate market is potentially devastating. However, federal and state opportunities still exist but rarely for small businesses, what can be done to streamline the process and provide access to such opportunities? So I think this is around bidding and uh, uh, minority women-owned business uh, opportunities, kind of similar to what we, what you kind of addressed with the 30 billion for small, local uh, uh, economic development agencies, credit unions, and, and community banks to kind of set that money aside for small and uh, city-based businesses. This is on the yeah, so there's an additional there's an additional sixty billion that's set aside sixty uh, in this package um, for um, kind of some of those businesses that were uh, getting left out and left behind from the last package. So rural um, business based in, in rural America, minority owned businesses, etc. Um, that funds that they can avail themselves that, that are especially targeted to to make sure that they're available, um, given that a large percent or a proportion of the the other funds weren't getting. Um, to as, as broad a cross section as, as was necessary. With regards to uh, some of the issues around um, federal contracting, there's, uh, uh, candidly, it's not my uh, full on area of expertise, but happy to um, have our team follow up with you if you want to engage uh, directly. Um, I think an open question as well at this point um, about how much, um, how much construction at a federal level is, um, uh, how much of that's going to go forward and what those, some of those programs are, programs are going to be and, and what they're going to look like. There's been, as you're well aware, um, discussion about infrastructure week for the past three years. Um, I, uh, there's, um, the, some of us have been pushing for that as part of a, a next package here because we've got, um, if we're going to spend $3 trillion, you might as well start spending on stuff that's also going to not just, provide needed rescue today, but also put people to work and provide a long-term payoff and, and add an in, or increased infrastructure, which we so desperately need. Um, Mitch McConnell's thrown some cold water on that pretty quick. Um, that's not to say it can't happen, but that is to say that there might be a bit more of a political debate and discourse about this going forward, but it is gonna be one that 
I think the president has indicated that he wants to do. Um, he had initially said something, and this is about a year or so ago, to the tune of $2 trillion. I don't think that's gonna be the case given the, the uh, fact that we just spent $3 trillion. Um, but I think without question, there's gonna be an opportunity here. And I, I do think there's also where um, some of us are urging, um, gonna be pushing on Congress to go as big as we possibly can on everything from roads and bridges to uh, rural broadband to um, issues like um, sewer systems and septic systems. Um, so there's an awful lot of you know, trying to, to meet the need of you know, communities like the ones I represent that have huge issues with combined sewage overflow and stormwater runoff, right? Um, there's a lot we can do there to roll all into funds and, and making uh, greater uh, funds available and accessible. Um, but when it comes to the federal requir the requirements um, for a sh individual shop to be able to apply and avail themselves of that money, um, I'd have to follow up with you because I'm not I'm not wholly fluent in some of those details, but happy to, to work with you to figure out if there's more we can do. Okay. I think along those same lines, like we're getting many questions from the Cape Verdean community and uh, the NAACP uh, about access to the PPP program and loans and assistance to um, from, from local lenders and whatnot. Um, and there was some language issues. I think we've been working on, on accessing websites that have, have uh, those uh, languages uh, highlighted for the information. However, um, what do you have to say, I guess, to uh, businesses here in Brockton that are having some challenges accessing uh, these resources uh, to save their businesses and strengthen their businesses? So um, reach out to our office, reach out to Congressman Lynch's office, uh, reach out to SBA directly. Um, that would be the, the, the place I would start. And understanding that that's, that can be a, a bit of a challenge, but recognizing that Congress did, um, part of, understandably there's frustration in um, doing some of these issues, um, allocating some of these funds in a, in a piecemeal way, as you heard me we talk about. But part of that is when you, when you do something and then you realize that, hey, there's parts of this that didn't work. We weren't intending, Congress didn't intend for small business money to get access by 70 public companies. Um, you know, that, that wasn't the, the goal behind this funding, right? Um, it did, well, there's adjustments that need to be made. Let's make them. Um, when this money went out, the hope was that it was going to be uh, available and accessible to um, to small business owners, the, um, the bodega, um, the corner store, the salon, you know, the construction site, uh, the construction company. To the extent that there have been barriers, existing barriers that have made it more difficult for members of various communities to gain access to that fund, those funds, we need, Congress needs to respond and make sure we're taking them down. Um, and so I, uh, I hope, um, and my intent is that, or my belief is that with a, um, a bit of a spotlight on some of the inequities in terms of who was able to access, get access to the first pot of money, how quickly various actors were able to gain access to it, how others were left out, um, that there's been a conversation between Congress and some of those banks to try to say, hey, you know, you can't just process, even though we saw um, off of the spreadsheet, um, that um, big loans there were a very small percentage of, uh, of the overall um, uh, loan portfolio, and there was more a total of, uh, amount of money allocated for the smaller level loans and the bigger ones. Um, those bigger loans are still, they're big and that's a lot of money. So let's make sure that it's, uh, you're not leaving people out that don't necessarily have access to lawyers, advocates, accountants, lobbyists that can navigate that, you know, have long held established, uh, established relationships with some of the bigger lenders out there that can navigate that process just to get to the front of the line. Part of that might happen, but let's be intentional about making sure that is minimized. Okay, and so here, here's uh, one that's relevant to right now. Uh, the funds were voted last night. I believe the president signed it last night. It, it goes into effect, um, I guess, immediately. But when will the portal reopen? It, it, it was closed down. Both the EIDL and the PPP online portals have told people that it's closed. Will those open up today or tomorrow, and will they stay open? 24 seven or just during business hours? Kevin, I don't know, so that was a, a great question. I had that one last night when, when we were driving back about um, when they were gonna open back up. Kevin, do you happen to know? Or if you do, maybe you can respond on if you're muted. I saw uh, I don't have an exact update on when those portals will open up. Uh, the way the PPP program works is many banks are keeping an internal queue that they didn't 
get rid of the first time around when the program ran out of money. So my guess is they'll continue to process it on a first come first serve basis like they have been. When it comes to the disaster loan and the link opening up on the SBA's website, I don't have an update on that yet, but I'd be happy to share that with anybody who has questions, they can email me and I'll let them know when that opens. Thank you. We've had some folks uh, apply to the EIDL and not receive the funds yet. I've been trying to reassure them. We applied on the very first day and we received funds Wednesday night. Uh, so as a chamber of commerce, um, was we were eligible for the EIDL, but not the PPP. I know you guys are aware of that. The 501c6 has got left out. Uh, I think that's being addressed or I, I know Congressman, you thought it was a procedural thing. I hope that could be handled that way or whether is that going to be handled procedurally or is it going to have to be put back into phase four? Um, this is something we've heard, as you, uh, you said, Chris, we've heard an awful lot about. Um, and as you know, we're, uh, we tried last time to push through in, in, in this phase. Um, I'll go back to our colleagues. I don't think that there's any real, any good reason for the, uh, for the exclusion. Um, and in fact, look, as I said at the top of my comments, um, Chambers in the midst of crises like this, um, it is chambers that have been extremely effective and not only channeling some of those questions and concerns with the administration of the program and availability of those funds, but for folks like me to be able to actually um, hear the concerns across the community and get information out to community members and to business owners so that they understand how to navigate that process. So the idea that we're leaving uh, chambers in limbo at this moment is absolutely nuts. Um, we pushed through, uh, we try to push hard to have that adjusted this last time. Um, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to come up with a way to get it done because it needs to happen. Thank you. So, so if we applied on the first day and we received funds on Wednesday and the funds are being released every Wednesday, we're telling people, look in your account next Wednesday, you might see uh, money from the EIDL advance in there at that point. And I think they're just, I think this is going to pick up momentum as uh, we go along here into the month of May, uh, you know, just in terms of the mechanism, getting the money into the people's accounts. So I've told people not to give up. I think many people did just hit that box and said, yes, I'm applying for 10,000 because I have expenses already uh, exceeding that. But I think with so many applications, they pulled back and just allocated based on the number of employees you said you had. So in our case, we have five employees, so we, we received five thousand dollars. We're telling people don't expect the ten thousand; you might just get a thousand, you know, based. I think I'm seeing some uh, Kevin, you know, uh, agreeing with that. So I think that's kind of where we're at. On yeah, that. that's that was an internal thing the SBA did um, in the middle of this whole process is decided that due to the number of applications they're getting that it's going to be $1,000 per employee to determine what that cash advance is going to be. Originally, it was supposed to be based on similar um, criteria as a PPP program. So rental costs, uh, payroll costs, etc. But the number of uh, applications they received, that's the determination they came to. We've got a transportation company that's asking if the transportation is covered under that the utilities and fuel if they need to uh, run vehicles? That I do not believe is covered on that, but if you give me one minute, I can get you an actual answer. Well, thank you. So that would be like gasoline, I guess, for the, or diesel in this case. Um, also, uh, people are asking about the six week, uh, the eight weeks of $600 per week. Uh, if say a bookkeeper goes from 40 hours to one day a week, eight hours, would they be eligible for unemployment and the $600? Or do you have to lay somebody off or furlough them completely? So for that, if individuals are brought back onto payroll through the program, I'm guessing is what the question is asking, that individual would not be eligible for unemployment anymore. So if you're fully back on a payroll with the average amount of money that you'd be making during that time frame, you would not be eligible for unemployment any longer. So um, if you do receive that, you do have to go back on a payroll. But if otherwise your company hasn't received that yet, you can stay on unemployment until they do. I think the question is if someone goes from full-time to part-time or part-time to to a smaller number of hours, will they qualify for the $600 a week? Sure. Um, and is that full-time to part-time because of the coronavirus itself? So if it's because of the coronavirus itself, the way that they looked at the loans being dispersed and the amount of money that you're getting for the PPP loans, they took a time frame either from, I believe it was June to November of last year, or it was January to early February, mid-February of this year to determine what the payroll costs were. So your average payroll would be in coordination with that time frame. So if you were full-time before this coronavirus happened and you went to part-time status, you should see the funding come through for you to be paid as a full-time employee again. 
So that at that time, you'd be able to get your full paycheck before this whole coronavirus happened, and you wouldn't have to worry about unemployment. You'd be able to be put on a full-time status again, if that makes sense. Interesting. All right. I, th I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to that later uh, with the state folks, too, because I think there's a piece to that that is state-related. Um, and I'm just going through here. 38 employees on payroll. Boy, there's some really involved questions here, so I'm going to fall forward them on, Kevin. Uh, if you hopefully you can tackle a couple. I don't know if you can see them up on the screen there. Some of these are pretty involved, um, but I bet you know the answer. Uh, yeah, of course. And feel free to send any of the more detailed ones to me. Um, any of the general ones, I'd, I'd be happy to answer over the call. Um, but any of the more detailed ones, I'd be happy to follow up with emails to people. You know, there's a lot of unemployment questions, and I think obviously that's a big concern for, for many people. Uh, I know we're talking about PPP, but do you want to say anything about the unemployment uh, and, and those resources that, that you, will we see in this fourth round, people are talking about maybe another $1,200 stimulus check, is that possible? So I think there's, um, I think there needs to be additional, you guys have heard me talk about the, uh, the need for additional cash payment. Um, uh, or cash transfer program to begin with, I was proposing around four thousand um, dollars. If you're making less than a hundred thousand dollars a year, uh, the um, the Senate proposal only went up to uh, was bumped up from a thousand to to twelve hundred. Um, so a couple of things here. There's um, there's an effort to to actually kind of uh, to overhaul a bit of the, the unemployment system. Um, Pramila Jayapal has a, a piece of legislation that actually mirrors what. Um, the system used by a number of countries in, in Europe where basically the government basically steps in and, um, and, and pays people salaries um, through their companies so that they actually never go off those payrolls and stay on those payrolls so you don't end up in an unemployment uh, uh, system at all. Um, somewhat similar, but a more streamlined version of that um, uh, PPP. Um, the, um, and you get your full salary and you just keep, keep paying people along um, to try to keep those businesses functioning and, and, and um, keep those salaries moving. Um, so that's one piece to it. Do I expect, given where we're at, um, where I'm pushing again for, for more direct cash payments, we've been, we've been pushing that for the past six weeks. Um, I haven't seen much traction on it so far um, in the Senate, uh, but we'll, we're going to keep trying. Um, the the effort that I just talked about around uh, kind of a streamlined version of PPP, um, interestingly enough, has some uh, some support across a widespread sector of ideology. Um, Josh Hawley, a very conservative uh, new member of the Senate from Missouri, and Pramila Jayapal have both kind of staked out some structures around uh, which um, that basic plan is is um, is framed, and it's gotten. A fair amount of support, actually, pretty quickly. Um, so we'll we'll see about that. I think, regardless, um, the I think there's there are some questions there about as people come back to work, whether it's a day a week, you know, twenty percent of time, or ten percent of time, or fifty percent of time. How that works with state unemployment assistance and the interaction with federal is is a, is a great question. Um, uh, probably the best question for some of those state officials. Um, I expect that that's. Um, there's going to be a number of cases where that happens. Some of the federal programs, as I think Kevin was articulating, the idea was basically trying to keep people on um, full time um, so that you didn't have that shift in, in, in time allotment. Although um, sometimes there, depending on how those plans are structured, the incentives might not be uh, might not be wholly aligned. Um, I do think when it comes to the next package, there's that's going to have to be the, the response needs to be based on need. And we know there's going to be a need for small businesses. We know if there's if it's true that um, these additional funds are going to be exhausted within the next uh, week or so or, or coming days, um, that individuals are also not just the businesses that suffer; it's the, the individuals that need to get their paycheck that they're not going to get that paycheck. Um, and that's going to be um, at that point um, for many folks. It'll be three or four weeks since they've been uh, since they've received a paycheck. That twelve hundred dollars, if they received it is not gonna go all that much further. And by the way, a week from now is the, the end of the month and the start of another month, a lot of more bills are due. Um, so there's a, a number of additional ideas that are kind of bubbling up. I think the um, size of that response, the timing of that response depends a bit on the pressure that comes with it. Um, if we see, you know, there's everything, as I said, from Pamela's bill to discussions around forbearance, um, to additional cash payments, there's, there's plenty of ideas. The question is gonna be kind of where is that 
coalesce and how big a package and, and focus on what. It's going to be small business again, individuals, but where. Thank you. Thank you for advocacy and thank you for bringing up infrastructure because, as you know, it's very important to the Chamber of Commerce to uh, see that advanced. And I, I think uh, that would be, uh, it seems to be agreeable on both sides of the aisle uh, to, that, that infrastructure needs to be invested in, especially you mentioned water and sewer, uh, which people have kind of neglected and overlooked for many, many years. Yeah. Yeah. Bridges are something we can see, the road condition is something we feel. Uh, but water and sewer is something that sneaks up on you and is very, very costly. So, thank you. and it's a yep. great thing to get people back to work in terms of uh, jobs. So, thank you for that. I know you're limited on time and you've got to run. Uh, I want to thank you, Congressman, for all you've done. Uh, staff, I know uh, that you are, are there on the backbone uh, taking care of a lot of this stuff. So, thank you for tuning in and helping uh, put this together. I know Dan is, uh, is here too. I he can't Yes, to hear us, I guess, but uh, thank you, Dan, for helping to facilitate this as well. And uh, we hope to have you back at some point and, and hear an update uh, when we can all get together in person. Please. Thanks so much, guys. Stay healthy. Stay safe. Be careful. Bye. Good luck. We're going to continue on with our state officials who are with us. Uh, we're so delighted to have Margaret and Susan uh, with us on the call. And uh, I know you just got off a call with the Lieutenant Governor and the Secretary of Labor and Economic Development. First off, can you touch on that unemployment question uh, about the, I don't know which one of you want to grab it, uh, about the $600 a month and how that kind of uh, dovetails with the state uh, qualifications. This is part full-time people going to part-time. Sure. I think what, I think what we're talking about is if an, if an individual has been either their hours have been decreased due to COVID-19 and so now they're they're receiving they are eligible to receive part-time unemployment insurance and individuals who are eligible for part-time unemployment insurance are also eligible for that additional six hundred dollars from the federal government so I hope that answers your question it does it does I think that was the question people were okay. wondering mm -hmm. they're hesitating I think in, in this uh in this situation uh, to lay people off, but uh, uh, this this way it may actually be uh, a way for them to continue on uh, and, and make people yeah. whole. And I was planning on talking a little bit about the work share program because I right. think that's a program that many businesses aren't aware of that they can take advantage of. And it's a program that works very well either for businesses who've been trying to maintain their level of staff and, and aren't maybe in a position to any longer be able to do that it's a layoff aversion program. And it's also a good opportunity for businesses who've had to furlough employees and perhaps when they're ready to start bringing folks back and they're not quite able to ramp up right away and bring everyone back um, all at once, it's a way that they can, they can offer an opportunity for them to do it gradually. So um, I can talk a little bit about that work share program if you'd like. Yeah, if you want to just uh, touch on that. I know the questions have been, do you, the way it's outlined is you have to have two people sharing a job. So if people have one person or three, is that, how does that work? No, you need, it, so the way the work, a work share plan can be, well, first of all, it's, it's a layoff aversion program. So what it is, is it's a way of, instead of laying off 20% of your workforce, you can reduce your company's hours and, reduce your company guard by 20%. So go to, let's say, a four-day work week, for example. That's just one example. Okay. So you would pay your employees for those four days that they work. And in addition, you would also continue to pay their benefits, their health insurance, their 401k, their life insurance, whatever benefits they have. And then on that one day where they do not come to work, they would be eligible and would receive unemployment insurance to supplement the day that they're not working. Okay. Now under this, I guess, right? So they would also, those folks now would also be eligible for that additional $600 through June. Would be the whole 600 or would the 600 be prorated to one, one fifth of the? It's, it's prorated until when they start this program. Okay. So, so how it works, you have, you have to reduce the hours between 10 and 60% of, of the work day. Okay. And you can, you can have this program last for up to 52 weeks, which, why, which, is, which is good because it goes longer than unemployment insurance. Unemployment insurance will take you through 39 weeks. This will take you through 52 weeks. Um, you can create multiple work share plans within an organization. 
So when they say you have to have two individuals to participate, you have to have a, you can, you can separate the work share plans by a department, by a shift, by, um, by a different um, group, any kind of, any different way. So you can have your HR department be reduced by 20%. You can have your administrative team reduced by 60%. You can have your um, accounting team reduced by 30%. So you can have multiple work share plans within your organization. Okay. But the individuals in those plans all have to be on the same plan. So you can't say, you know, you have Mary, John, and Sue all in the accounting department. You can't say Mary's reduced by 40, but John's only reduced by 10, and Sue's reduced by 30. You're all, anyone on that plan has the same number of reduced hours. Okay. For the same time frame. So that's how it works. So you can have multiple plans, but anyone in that particular group has to be considered the same. And, and everyone in that group needs to participate in the work share. Okay. So, it's not a real flexible plan. It's one where once you create that plan, it's set in motion and that's how it's going to stay and remain. So you kind of need to be thoughtful about really what your needs are. However, it does give individuals that, that reliability that they are keeping their job because you're not laying them off. It's just, you're just reducing their hours and then they're getting that supplement. And I think additionally now, knowing that they're getting that additional $600, it's even really more of, of a way for them to be made whole. Okay. So um, it's a tremendous program um, and it's very, you know, relatively simple to set up. And I can send a link where there's an actual video that shows employers how to just go on the site step by step. It's five minutes and you can That's walk them right through the program. That's great. We'll, we'll post that, Susan. Okay. And, uh, and again, I think there's a few questions in there relative to uh, work share and to uh, unemployment. So hopefully we can get those to you and hope maybe you can help us get some information and some links. Yeah. And just the latest on unemployment insurance this week really was the pandemic unemployment assistance or PUA was rolled out. There were over 100,000 applicants. Um, it's been... Well, relatively well received for those individuals. And again, I would, I would recommend that they just have all their ducks in a row, have their paperwork that they've done their homework on and that it's a relatively simple process for them to apply if, they've, if they have their, their paperwork ready to go. It should take them about 20 minutes. And so the satisfaction ratings have been relatively high for this. Um, and so they can just go to mass.gov backslash EUA to apply. Right. And, and then the um, call center is reopened now so people can actually call and get through to someone to ask questions. And they're still conducting the virtual town halls as well, where they walk you through step by step how to submit a claim. And then there's a Q&A session, too. That's terrific. I mean, great progress in the last three weeks from one, one little office to 700 people. I mean, that's tremendous. It's been tremendous, yeah. <laughs> uh, Margaret, can you give us a sense of uh, what you've learned this week from your Briefing with the uh, Lieutenant Governor and the Secretary. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Chris. And thanks, as always, for putting together such a great panel. Um, the Chamber has sure been a partner, of in invaluable partner during COVID with the resources that you're bringing together. So truly, uh, I'm grateful for your, your work and your leadership of you and your team. Thank you. Um, as you know, the governor is giving daily updates. Anybody that's looking to stay uh, in touch with that, we do post it every morning, what time it's going to be. The times are varying. Go to mass.gov and you can find that information for our daily updates. Um, one thing you mentioned on with uh, Congressman Kennedy's questions, and um, Kevin, this might be a good resource for your team as well. The, um, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, relative to the multilingual needs for the PPP program, um, Chris, actually your team, you, Rob May, really brought this to our attention early on, um, is that the Mass Growth Capital has coordinated, and the website is engagingsmallbusiness.org, and we are offering free technical assistance, multilingual, putting these applications together and giving guidance. So engagingsmallbusiness.org will connect you to all of those resources, please. You know, we heard that very much so about accessibility with PPP. And then um, with the funds being released, honestly being in touch with your uh, commercial loan officer and getting that in, getting that pipeline in and getting your homework in um, is really, really critical right now. 
couple of things that came up, um, trending topics. And I know, Chris, I was unable to join you last week, or I think it was late on your call last week, about the eviction moratoriums and what that means. And, you know, just to be clear, these are temporary protections uh, put in place to stabilize the home and commercial real estate, but it does not relieve a tenant of their rental obligation, not a residential rental relief, nor is a commercial rental relief. And, you know, I think what's really difficult, and we talked about this with some of the real estate companies, um, is that the messaging that they're feeling is being interpreted by the renter thinking they don't have to play. And right. it's really critical. I know um, Kevin Congressman Kennedy on another call we were with him um, on talked about, you know, that domino effect of the, how it is impacting the renter to the landlord, to the banks, and how critical that is that that's a connected chain. So just to get the message out on that, happy to talk to anybody through, you know, what we're defining as a small business is you need to just be in Massachusetts. So if you're in Massachusetts, Connecticut, and California, no. That doesn't apply to you. You have to have 150 employees or less. If you're a publicly traded company, this doesn't apply to you. So, you know, understanding what those definitions are, happy to ask, answer questions or talk offline um, to companies on that. And then real trending topic. And, you know, it's, it's, is it premature to have this conversation or just awareness of what's happening is there's a lot of anxiety about May 4th is ticking down the line a couple weeks away and reopening the economy. And what does that look like? So very much the message out of the Baker administration is that we are in the surge right now. And that is our primary focus, but we are hearing, um, and working on and starting to put together the conversations about reopening the economy and what that means. Now, when we were closing down, we went with a strategy of essential versus not essential. And going forward, we don't think that that's going to be the plan. Rather, we'll be looking at our public health data and trying to put together how we're going to determine which triggers, you know, the safe opening for workplaces and activities. So it's not going to be essential versus essential. It's what is it that we need to have in place to make business safe going forward? And what does the timeline like that look like? A lot of strategy um, is, will be going into that. As you know, the governor is partnering with some of our bordering states and looking at a regional approach. Our team is a part of that conversation. And I think the chamber will be a critical partner when that guidance is issued to us to communicate and to answer questions. So yes, we're hearing it. It's definitely percolating as the top trending question. However, we are not in the position today to have those details provided, yet stay tuned and Please share your concerns. You know, Massachusetts in being, you know, the 11th largest economy in the Commonwealth is here, you know, with a large global presence is hearing from what's happening worldwide and having those companies that have a presence in Massachusetts, giving that feedback into the governor's office as well. So um, we had a great call with Secretary of Economic Development, Housing and Economic Development, Mike Keneally as well as the Secretary of Labor and Workforce Development, Raza Costa. Every Friday they're tuning in with our municipality, economic development team, and you know the chamber. So it's always great to have you on. Sorry that we were a little late jumping on this one uh, with the time and conflict. I did um, a point that Secretary Costa made on today's call about that federal benefit. So yes, if you're on the work share, and she's reiterated this, if you're on work share, it, it, basically anyone collecting unemployment is entitled to that $600 federal benefit. You will receive that automatically, nothing separate to apply for. Okay. But just understand that unemployment insurance benefits are taxable income, including that $600. Okay. And so I saw a lot of the questions about that $600, how am I handling this with the employees? And you know, another trending question, if you're that hospitality industry or, or entry level job, and they're now getting the $600 benefit, are they coming back to work? And I just wanna be clear, um, these employees in their unemployment weekly are certifying, were you offered a job? Yes. Are they going to be truthful in that application and what are the employees and how is that going to be handled? I think you're going to be seeing, you know, the secretary Acosta's office offering some additional guidance, but somebody asked, you know, do you have any advice for us? And, and it brought me to some good advice that uh, I've been given and it's called either the slow dime or the fast buck, right? Fast buck, burning in money in my pocket today. Well, that fast buck expires July in July. And what is the economy going to look like for you to get a job in August? Yeah. So that $600 fast buck, 
but you want the slow dime with that employer that you've been working for that provides you maybe health benefits, that's maybe continuing to pay those health benefits now or, or not. What is, what is your long-term need? And make smart decisions for yourself as, as an employee. So for the employers that are out there, we're hearing this loud and clear uh, that it's affecting you and how it's gonna be affecting you with your PPP. I know the SBA had to jump off um, the call early. I'm happy to troubleshoot, you, you know, respond to some of those questions if that's helpful. Um, we've been with them every day. Um, and it, Kevin, you've got a great grasp. So we're grateful that you're with us this week. Okay, yeah, thanks Kevin. So the, the $600, is that pre-tax? Are they gonna have taxes taken out of that? Are they gonna receive 600 and then have to file the taxes next year and pay back the tax portion? Um, I believe they have the option to say, to take the taxes out or some opt not to. So it depends what the individual selected. Okay, all right. That's very helpful. And that did answer quite a few of our questions on that. Um, I didn't realize, I should have known this, I guess. Massachusetts is the 11th largest economy in the United States of America. So I have some good, uh, not in America, I'm sorry, within the, um, yes, we are the 11th largest economy, I'm sorry. Okay. And I, I want to give some good data, and I know Ely was on the call earlier, and my apologies if he said this, but when it came to the PPP loans, um, geez, I took a note here, where did I write it? But we got the ninth, um, most amount, Massachusetts businesses had the ninth largest PPP, we're, we're number nine in line for the PPP funding. Yeah, it was 10.4 billion. Yeah, that's correct. I did hear that. We actually got, we did very well. We, we uh, for, for a Rocky Marciano uh, reference, we, we were boxing above our class, I guess. Uh, so I, I got a smile out of the mayor on that one. And then, yeah, 47,000 Massachusetts businesses received the PPP funding. But let me tell you, and you know, I know we've talked about this, is there was a lot of frustration, in particularly with the minority community that had language barriers in getting access to the money. And I did also see this question in there about the portal being open. And just shout out because for those of you who are chamber members or contemplating joining the chamber, honestly, the local banks are at every chamber event. They sponsor every chamber event. And you know what? They're always there for you. And now they're the ones who are just killing it as far as bringing in the funds for PPP. So truly, if you're struggling, like I'm going into the weekend and we're worried the money's going to run out quickly, what to do? If there's a banker that you have a business working relationship with through the chamber, honestly, put the call in and ask because you want your paperwork in the top of that pile. And, uh, you know, truly we have tremendous chamber member banks that are PPP lenders who have been coming through for their clients. And we're really grateful for working with them and, you know, been on a few webinars with them as well. So don't wait till Monday be there, get your homework in, you need guidance. And the other one was a um, question I saw in the Q&A, Chris, was who can we call we want a human to talk to? And I think that Kevin's put himself out there as a human to talk to. Myself and Sue, many every Friday our phone rings after these calls. We are here. We're going to be a human for you to talk to. And we have great understanding and depth of the SBA programs. Mind you, Sue and I work for the Commonwealth. The SBA is a federal program. But working in the Mass Office of Business Development with Secretary Keneally's office, you know, we are here to be a resource to get you the answers. And so if we don't know them, we do have internal contacts to expedite them for you. But as we're doing this each day, we're getting the questions, we're hearing the same questions and I'm just sharing your frustration, but by all means, please reach out to us. Thank you, Margaret, and thank you, Susan, and thank you, Kevin. We're going to post all of your email addresses up there. And I, you know, I, I think you heard me on the state call on Tuesday. We're very fortunate to have Susan and Margaret in our region. They both kind of joined the team just about six months ago, and which we're perfectly placed to, to to partner with us to make this happen. So thanks so much. You guys are a wonderful wealth of information. So batting cleanup, you like that one? Uh, batting cleanup. The mayor is with us. Uh, this is uh, you know we're at the height of this. Hopefully situation here in the city uh, in the state uh the city might be uh lagging i don't know the mayor's going to tell us but uh he you know as i said early on we were all trying to make this work today and i know you've had very busy uh schedule as well mayor so thanks for joining us on the tail end here and uh, can you tell us what's gone on the last week and, and where is brock in, in terms of uh relative to the rest of the state and the peak of this thing yeah, Chris, thank you very much. And, and it's good to see Susan and, and, and Margaret and, and Kevin. Um, this is such a, a valuable resource weekly, and, and I really look forward to always being on it. And uh, I'm sorry I missed the congressman, but 
I'll catch it up uh, with him. But uh, yeah, another sad day in Brockton. We lost another two residents today. It brings a total loss of life of 106 people have passed away from COVID, 106. And, you know, it's, um, I just got off an interview a little while ago. I mean, we're talking about um, people's lives and, and of course, uh, thoughts and prayers go to the, you know, the people that have passed and of course they're surviving. Uh, loved ones, but it's a serious, serious problem, not just plaguing Brock and its Commonwealth, its nation, its world, but uh, we're really at a hot spot right now in the city of Brock. And um, I, I do want to thank Governor Baker and Lieutenant Governor Polito and DPH and Mima. Two things that have happened really positively uh, this week in Brock and uh, starting on last Tuesday was the contact tracing services, partners in health um, that is really, really assisting us as we uh, trace the uh, the spread of this virus and reaching out. Of course, we were doing that locally with our Board of Health. We only have one health nurse, but we had eight school, Brockton public school nurses helping on that. And it's, it's hours and hours of, of reaching out to folks. So thank you very much to the governor and, and Mima and DPH and, and Lieutenant Governor Polito. The other really wonderful benefit, uh, it was announced the other night by, by the governor is increased testing in our neighborhood health centers. Of course, Brockton Neighborhood Health Center is, is benefiting from that. Had a call with Sue Joss this morning, the executive director, along with Kim Holland, CEO of Brock and Signature Hospital and Good Samaritan as well. And the increased testing is, is extremely, extremely important. We're actually going to dial up a, uh, a, a on-site testing uh, facility at Brock and High School in the parking lot. We're working on that right now. It's, it's being finalized. But Chris, you know it. I mean, you're here. Um, you, you talk to me on a regular basis uh, on our you know, regular weekly business call with the associations. And I have a weekly call with, uh, with the banks. And uh, this week it was about the PPP funding and it was Eastern Bank and Harbor One and Rockland Trust and Crescent Credit, Sharon and Webster and Northeast Savings Bank. And uh, I think Margaret hit it on the head. If you have a local lending institution, you know, they're going to bat for you. So please, please follow up on that. Um, some positive news, again, we're going to get some HUD funding, uh, 841000 is coming to Brockton, coordinated through our BRA. Uh, I'm still waiting on the contract from the feds, and I'll sign it, and they'll wire the money as soon as possible, and then we're going to streamline it out to residents and businesses. Um, but another piece of information is I drafted a letter on behalf of uh, the mayor's office to all, every single business in the city of Brockton is going to receive a letter from me, uh, providing information and website and links and contact information, I think it's extremely valuable, uh, but it is, uh, it is actually hitting every single business that operates in the city of Brockton. So um, that's, that's the good news. Again, the sad, bad news is the numbers keep increasing, but we have such brave men and women uh, that are working on the front line, putting their lives on the line, Chris, and uh, you know, the nurses, the doctors, the techs, the PAs uh, that are saving lives and, and in the nursing homes as well, and police and fire, but we're all in this together, right? It doesn't matter if you're uh, on this call as a business owner, or if you're the mayor, if you're a CEO, if you're a postman, we're in the people business. And right now, my job is to save lives in the city of Brockton. And I really welcome all of your professionalism, your support, your expertise as we move forward. So, Mayor, thank you so much. And I know uh, you and your wife are on the front lines here out in the community every day and, and dealing with this. Uh, so thank you for that. Um, in terms of you and I talked a little bit on Monday on the business call about pivoting uh, and anticipating well, two things. One is you've allowed construction to continue on in the city, and that has made all the difference. Many of the contractors who were blocked out of Boston, the subs have been able to come to Brockton and keep these construction projects moving forward, which is vitally important to the banks, the financiers, the, the, the developers, the own, building owners, all of that, uh, as well as the guys that are working still and the women that are working uh, on the site. Um, in, in terms of permitting, though, and keeping that pipeline going, I know there's some talk about uh, the city council maybe going online. Uh, the, the permitting uh, building inspector, maybe the planning, uh, possibly zoning, uh, having some routine meetings. Uh, is that something you think will happen in the month of May? Or? Oh, yeah. Well, first of all, the school committee and city council have been online virtual Zooms for, uh, for a while now. And I want to thank the uh, vice chairman, Mark D'Agostino, on the school side, and Shirley Azak, the council president. I had a conversation with our law department just yesterday to talk about planning and ZBA and CONCOM. Uh, you know, business has to continue, right? And we know at some point, the new normal, whatever that is, is going to happen. Uh, and we, we, we really will be doing a disservice if we, uh, if we stop moving forward, um, not, not, uh, not, you know, minimizing uh, the health implications and the loss of life, but also understanding that business uh, will need to have 
uh, the ability to to regrow and 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 recalculate and 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 so what I'm doing is I'm working right now um, to streamline the process so that we can do virtual. Uh, as you know, some of the um, direct to butter type of testimony is difficult to do on virtual. But if you watch the NFL draft last night, okay. if they can do it, we can do it. Uh, and so I think we're going to use that really as a catalyst to move forward, Chris. And I hear you. I mean, I'm a business guy myself. And, um, you know, I think there's, uh, there's a, an ability to move forward that's going to be safe, but also business friendly. And we'll get there. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's kind of a nice segue to uh, next week. We're going to be here back uh, May 1st at 2 p.m. We have a specialist from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and they're anticipating two things. One is OSHA uh, starting to weigh in on work from home regulations and also uh, provisional workers and how we're going to kind of get back to normal. They're also put together some model programs for reentry of businesses back to your offices. So I think many people are trying to imagine how that's going to work. We're starting to hear different models of maybe skeleton crews coming back or every other day to keep social distancing going for a time. And so uh, they've actually got people on staff. I don't know if you've ever been to the U.S. Chamber, but it's right across from the White House. They have uh, 4,000 employees and they've got folks working on these little projects or big projects uh, in trying to anticipate uh, what it may look like and how they can be helpful to create a model for maybe your local company or a company that you service or, or you're an attorney for or a uh, accountant for that you can kind of provide them a model boilerplate of how to bring employees back and then what they're going to need you know will uh, people be able to walk right in off the street the first day and first week maybe not if they do how are they going to be queued up and that type of thing i think we're all familiar with grocery stores but offices are a little different story and uh so there's also going to be concerns and that type of thing. Anyway, so we'll have a specialist from the U.S. Chamber uh, Foundation here uh, next week, uh, as well as hopefully we'll have our uh, city and state folks back as well, and we can continue to share information. We'll also hopefully have some good news stories uh, in terms of businesses that have received financing and assistance. Uh, and uh, as everyone has said, get in the queue. If you're a small business, you know a small business, get in the queue. A lot of these small business bankers are our neighbors and our friends. They may have uh, relatives that are sick. Uh, they may be sick. They may be trying to figure out how to work from home. So they, they're getting backlogged on stuff. But if you can get your information to them and they get you in the queue, then if there's another phase of funding, which the Congressman mentioned as a possibility in May, you'll be in that queue and be able to hopefully receive those funds and benefit not only your business and your employees, but our communities will bring those dollars back to the city and to the region. So I want to thank you all for participating today. I hope you have a nice weekend. And uh, again, we look forward to seeing you back here uh, next week. Have thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Yeah.